Hello, Circleville Church, family and friends. This will be my first attempt at trying to do Facebook Live from my home office. I apologize now for perhaps the uh, screeching of a parrot. In the other room is uh, Roatan, the uh, large uh, Amazon parrot. And we also have Skipper over there. We perhaps might have a cat or two running around. And so if that takes place, I do apologize. Uh, we're going to be doing a lecture series uh, once a week. And a lecture series is going to be going through church history and looking at where we've come, what the events in church history, and the controversies that have shaped and molded modern Christianity. Um, history is one of those wonderful, wonderful studies that helps us understand more and more of why we think the way we do, where certain attitudes and and foundations in the very essence of who we are, where they came from. And uh, I hope that this challenges you. I am much more comfortable using scripture as something to, to preach from and speak from. Um, I owe a lot to uh, a certain textbook for this particular lecture series, uh, Christianity Through the Centuries by uh, Earl Carnes. Uh, it was a textbook that I had when I was in uh, college. Um, I had two wonderful, wonderful professors, uh, Dr. Howard Voss, who was the professor of archaeology at the King's College, as well as uh, Dr. Fry, who was my advisor and uh, the head of the Biblical Studies Department. And uh, these two gentlemen certainly gave me a, a hunger and a thirst, not simply for God's Word, but to understand history. Uh, Dr. Voss would often say in his uh, classes that if we as human beings fully understood God, fully understood his word, fully understood history, fully understood science, there would be no contradictions. But because we are fallible, sinful, fallen human beings, we don't understand God fully. We don't understand his word fully. We don't understand history or science fully. And so we are filled with dilemmas and contradictions but that's not God's fault. That's ours. And so we're going to be looking into church history and its events and controversies that have shaped and molded us. Uh, I did a brief outline, and uh, if I hold too true to my outline, we could have as many as 40 lectures over the course of perhaps uh, the next year or so. Uh, if this COVID-19 situation ends, uh, perhaps these will be lectures at the fellowship hall at church. And so I encourage and I welcome all those who uh, will hear this and participate and perhaps uh, be challenged a little bit and where your faith has come from. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are worthy of, of our intellectual endeavors. Lord, you are worthy of, of our hearts and our souls and our minds. And so, Lord, we want to give our whole self to you. We ask, dear Lord, that as we, we approach a lecture series, not a sermon, not a Bible study, but a lecture series where we are challenged to, to think about certain things in history, that perhaps you might open our hearts and minds and eyes so that we might be more faithful to you, that perhaps Scripture would be opened up more clearly to us, that we would be challenged in some of our foundational thoughts and pre-thoughts, our, our presuppositions. Lord, help us, for we need you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, we're actually going to start before the church, before the book of Acts, before Jesus even. Um, we, we find out that in Scripture, uh, there are a number of of interesting verses that, that encourage us uh, to, to think a little bit this way. Uh, the, the title of this lecture series is The Stage. The stage that is set for Christ and the stage that is set for the early church, for Christianity to, to take root and to, to move forward. And one of the phrases that's used in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, is in the fullness of time. Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is, is reminding us that the time was right in the fullness of time is when Jesus came, when the Son of God, the Son of Man, 
the Savior of the world, stepped into our world, our history, so to speak. It was at the right moment, in the fullness of time. In Mark 1, verse 15, Jesus himself uh, talks about that the time was right, that the time had come. And so what made that time of, of our history, of humanity, the right time? And those are some of the things that we're going to be looking at during this lecture. Um, it was not just the Jewish people that were prepared for the coming of Christ. And that's something that I would like you and I to have kind of a, a, a deeper sense of, that even the Gentiles, even the, the, the world beyond Judaism, beyond Israel, was ready for the coming of Christ. Hence, when we read the New Testament, it becomes abundantly obvious that God's plan all along, if we read the Old Testament as well, was for the Jew first, but yes, to Samaria and to the outer corners of all the world. It is just amazing that God had prepared culture. God had prepared the, the, the known world at the time for the coming of Christ. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to focus on Rome. We're going to focus on Greece. And we're going to focus on Israel. And how each of these cultures, each of these societies, each of these these foundations, so to speak, were at the right moment for the coming of Jesus Christ and the foundations of the church to be set. First, Rome, the Pax Romana. What is that? Well, it's Latin. And what it means is the peace of Rome. You see, never before in all of history had one empire ruled such a large area of the world never before and never after. I want you to think about that. We could often say, well, what if Jesus came back now? I mean, with our ability to uh, translate and with the computers and everything else. The world right now is less receptive to the gospel than it was when Jesus came, the advent of Christ. It was in the fullness of time. It was the right moment. One of the reasons was the Pax Romana. Rome politically had conquered what we call the known world. Basically, most of Africa, most of Europe, most of Asia, all the Middle East. It was under one rule. Now, it wasn't perfect peace, but it was. There was the peace of Rome. And Rome brought with its politics. Rome brought with its sovereignty, so to speak, the idea of unity, that there was, in a sense, all mankind was one. Now, the Jewish people didn't even have that attitude. The Jewish people felt since they were God's chosen people, they were a cut above and the rest were, were dogs. But Rome, at its essence, in its, its thought, it's teaching. Now, in a practical circumstance, I have no doubt that somebody who lived in the city of Rome, somebody who was from one of the elite families, was arrogant and, and, and snobby, so to speak. But Rome, in its teaching, taught that all of humanity was, was of value. All of humanity was, was of unity, of, of one body, so to speak. And that is why when Rome instituted its laws, it was for every Roman citizen. And technically, there was a point when Rome offered citizenship freely to everyone within their borders, everyone who was under their control. The thinking process, the, the foundational thinking process of Rome, the politics of Rome, was the fact that Man is one. All of humanity deserves to be under a, a, a healthy rule, a healthy law. There was never a time in history that that took place until Rome conquered. Now, 
another one of the wonderful things about Rome was its free travel. Approximately two to three hundred years before Jesus, the roads of Rome were just spread out. They literally went out like a like the spokes of a wheel from the city of Rome, from a very central spot in Rome where there was the great forum, where there was the golden pillars. And those roads went out to, to every corner of the empire. And Rome was so meticulous that many of those major roads, major highways still exist today. They were built out of concrete. They were the reason why the Roman legions were able to, to move so quickly around the empire. And that freedom to travel had never existed before. The peace of Rome under one rule allowed missionaries like the Apostle Paul to move freely throughout the entire empire sharing the good news, the gospel of Christ. That would have never been possible 100, 200, 300, 400 years before that. And after the Roman Empire crumbled, it wasn't possible either for many centuries. It was in the fullness of time, God's plan, when Jesus Christ came. So the road system, that free travel, even individuals like Pompeii, when we know that name because of the city of Pompeii, covered by Mount Vesuvius. Pompeii was our general in Rome who helped create this Pax Romana, this peace, and he destroyed and routed the pirates of the Mediterranean Sea, so that even the seas were a place of relative safety. So Rome, its political freedom, its, its idea of unity of mankind, its law, its peace, its travel. It was these things that helped set the stage for the coming of Christ. I want you to think now about that Roman army for just a moment. Just like our modern armies, Rome deployed legions around the entire empire. Now, most of the preceding empires did not do things the way Rome did. Rome would, would take a set of individuals and deploy them and keep them there for a while, but then move them to another spot, very similar to our modern understanding of, of a military today. And many of those Roman soldiers were hungering and thirsting because they were partially homesick and they listened and looked and were interested in the culture of wherever they found themselves, and they were ripe for learning about Christ. They were, they were ready to, to fill that void in their heart. And many, historically, even outside of the Bible, we find out Roman soldiers gravitated to Christianity. And in many ways, they became some of also the first missionaries. It is likely, and it's uh, accepted by most scholars, that the first individuals to bring Christianity to Europe, meaning uh, England and, and Britannia, would have been the soldiers of Rome. And you say, wow, how God set the stage in the fullness of time. When Rome conquered the peoples of the world, and establish their empire. I want you to think for a moment what that would have done to an individual's faith in their local God. What they understood then was their God did not protect them. Their God was not as powerful as they thought. And so as the Roman Empire, before Christ, waved across the known world and allowed the people to, to survive, and even allowed them to have their gods. The Roman Empire, by the mere fact that they conquered the people, left a spiritual void, so to speak. The peoples of the world realized that their gods were not all-powerful. Their god was not sufficient for them. And this Pax Romana, this peace of Rome that conquered the known world, literally created a spiritual vacuum, a void where the people of each of those regions 
were looking for a relationship with a God that would be fulfilling, a God of all creation, a God of power. And they, they were looking, they were waiting. And who were they looking for? Well, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. The mystery religions are the religions that kind of really popped up during this peace of Rome. We're going to talk about intellectual thought when we come to, to Greece and the Greek Hellenistic culture in a few moments. But what took place during this void or this vacuum was the insurgence of what is called the mystery religions. Um, the uh, religion of Sybil, and she is known as the Earth Mother or the Earth Goddess, and that religion comes out of Turkey. Mithra, which comes out of uh, Persia, the, the worship of the goddess Mithra. Um, Isis, the goddess of, of death and resurrection of, of Egypt. Now, each of these mystery religions have elements to it that are very, very similar to Christianity. So similar that there are some non-Christian scholars that will say Christianity borrowed from these, these religions, which is not the word of God. It is not the truth. And because of the Old Testament, we could see where Christianity, where Christ the Messiah came from. But the reality that the worship of Sybil had with it um, sacrifice and the baptism in blood, the baptism in blood of a bull, actually. And you say to yourself, wow, sacrifice and baptism. Well, there's a lot of Christianity in that. And then you look at Isis, the Egyptian goddess, and you realize death and resurrection. Wow, that has a lot of Christianity in it. And then you look at Mithra and the special meals, ceremonial meals of unity, communion. And you think of these things and the stage that was set. So these mystery religions that many people were gravitating to in that void, that emptiness that the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome created. And you realize that God was setting the stage for the greatest evangelistic missionary opportunity for Paul to take Christ to the world. In the fullness of times, my friend, the stage was set. God was at work long before Jesus was born. God was at work, not just simply in Israel, but in the entire world, setting the stage for the world to come to know Jesus Christ, to the Jew first, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then all four corners of the world in the fullness of time. Now we're going to move to Greece for a moment. So we've got Rome and the city of Rome and, and the Pax Romana. And now we're going to talk about Greece. And for the most part, the city of Athens. So we've got Rome and we've got Athens. And Rome may have conquered Greece politically, but Greece conquered Rome culturally. The, the mindset, the, the philosophies of the ancient world were Greek in nature. And that, that understanding, that thinking process, that philosophy set the stage not only for Christianity to be accepted, but also for much of how we as modern human beings understand education, understand science, understand how to think. The Greek mindset, the Greek philosophy, its intellect took the world. Now, before we even talk about that, I would like you to think about the common language of the Greek language. Throughout the entire empire of Rome, Latin was not spoke fluently. They had the roads. They had the peace, but there was a common language throughout the entire world of the time, and that was Koine Greek. 
Koine Greek, which the New Testament was written in, was the language of the people. It was common language. It was not the king's English or the queen's English. It was the common vernacular, the common language of the people. And that language was the language of trade. That language the, was the language of business. That was the language of the day. And you could go anywhere in the entire Roman world. And if you spoke Koine Greek, if you wrote Koine Greek, you were fine. And just as today, English is the language for the most part that is understood around the world. Greek language, Koine language, was the language of the day. And so in Israel, you knew Hebrew, but you also knew Greek. In Rome, you knew Latin, but you also knew Greek. If you were in Persia, you would know the Arabic languages, but you would also know Greek. And so God had set up the right moment in history for the entire world to be speaking one language. Just think about that. How amazing our God is. It's not by chance. It's not by coincidence. What a secular person who does not believe in the existence of God, what a secular person would say, well, that's why Christianity took off. It was at the right place at the right time. It was just by chance. No, it was the plan of the sovereign God who set the stage in the fullness of time. So here we have now the Greek culture, the language. And now I want you to think about the philosophy, the thinking. Now, many of us know about the Greek gods. And Rome had similar gods that they took from the Greek culture. But the schools of philosophy, you've heard the names of Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. These individuals, these schools of thought, as they spent their lives thinking, postulating, hypothesizing, literally, they dismantled polytheism. Literally, through rational thought, they proved to themselves and to most of the world at the time that the gods of the old way were, were not possible. There's, there is no way that the gods of, of Greece that were as sinful as human beings, just more powerful, could be real. And what ended up happening was there again, was this, this emptiness, this void. People wanted a relationship with the Creator. People wanted a, a relationship with God, and yet their gods seemed to be inept. Their gods seemed to be unavailable to them. And Greek thought, the philosophies of, of Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, slowly, bit by bit, ebbed away at the reality of, of a relationship with these Greek gods and with polytheism in general. And throughout the entire Roman world, Rome conquering and in a sense conquering the gods of, of local people, and even the gods of Rome and Greece themselves, it was obvious that these gods were, were of no value. Now, out of that idea there was two major worlds of thought that came out of Greek philosophy. One you would know as the Stoicism or Stoics. These individuals believed in an afterlife. They believed in a strict moral code that one must live by. And these individuals were, in a sense, works righteousness people. They were the Stoics. And then there was another school of thought, the Epicureans. These individuals felt that pleasure was of the highest order and that when they're dead, they're dead. There's nothing after that. So take life 
for all it's worth right now, live life, experience. And so they became very immoral, very much so. They lived for their self-pleasure. And these two schools of thought within the Greek philosophies battled with one another. For a moment, I'd like you to think about the church of Jesus Christ. We have individuals in our church that certainly fall into that stoic mindset, strict moral codes, work, 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 not accepting so much the grace of Christ, but that strict adherence to, to being almost perfect. The, the legalism of the Old Testament carried into the New Testament, carried into our churches today. And that Epicurean desire and hunger for, for sensuality, sensation, emotions, emotionalism is rampant in modern Christianity. If it doesn't feel good, then I'm not going. If the music isn't my music, if the preaching isn't my preaching, if the room isn't lit the way I want it lit and decorated the way I want it decorated, if it doesn't meet my needs and make me feel good, that's not Christianity. That is pre-Christianity, Epicurean philosophy. And yet, it is still those two schools of thought that battle today. They take the stage again for the world to be ripe for those mystery religions that there was thinking that went into it, history and stories and relationships. But then Jesus comes on the stage in the fullness of time, at the right moment, as society as a whole, culture as a whole, was hungry for a personal relationship with the sovereign God of all creation. Greek thought dismantled polytheism, and people either turned to the mystery religions or they became atheistic agnostic. What is taking place today? And so we have Rome and its politics. We have Greece and its philosophy. And of course, we have Judaism, the Jews. Before we go to that, I want you to think for a moment, still a little bit, about that Greek thought. It was the Greek philosophers that looked at this world that we live in as being a shadow of truth. And that philosophy, that thought process, went throughout the entire empire. They, they looked at this world as, as I said, a shadow. Plato talked about being in a cave and having a campfire and a shadow of a human being casting on the wall. And that the experience you and I have in this world is seeing that shadow. We don't see the reality. And so the Greek philosophers looked at eternal truth and saw that as the, the height of reality and saw temporal truth and material world as being not eternal, as being uh, something that was, was less than. They saw the good and, and beautiful and love and truth, those things that are hard to define as being what man needs to find and yet cannot define because we are on this side of eternity. So you have the spiritual and the eternal, and you have the material and the temporal. Now we're going to move on to the Jewish people. The Jewish people did not honor the politics of Rome and the peace. The Jewish people did not bring the intellect of, of Greece and Athens. 
the Jewish people brought the history and the faith and the revelation of Jerusalem, of God. And so we've got Rome and Athens and Jerusalem. We got the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, and then the Jewish Empire of Israel. First, we want to think about the thought. Judaism did not seek God. They accepted the God that sought after them. All the other religions of mankind, of Rome, of Greece, of, of beyond, to reach, find God, to grab God, to earn God's approval. Judaism was unique and that it accepted the fact that God saw after them, that God chose them, that God created them. And in this idea, in this thinking process, in this foundational thought, Judaism was looking for the Messiah, was realizing that it was on God's terms and not theirs, that life was to be lived. Um, I want you to think about where they would get this from in their history of of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Think for a moment of Jacob wrestling at the riverside and, and speaking with God. Abraham being called by God out of out of Ur of Chaldees, out of Babylon, and, and brought to the promised land. Out of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's covenants that God made with them. Out of the burning bush where God appeared to Moses. All through the Jewish history, God stepped into the Jewish people's lives, and he chose them. And that thinking process shaped and molded the Jewish people differently than other people. They had been taught by God that there was only one God, and they struggled with this. They lived for centuries amidst idolatry. They lived for centuries amongst polytheism, many gods. And it wasn't until after their Babylonian exile, the captivity, and their return that they finally said, no more. There is only one God, the, the, the Shema, the prayer. There is just one God. We'll talk about that in a moment, but that thinking process, that that underlying identity the Jewish people were made them different than anyone else in the entire world. So much that they were hated, and much of that is still true today. Much of hatred of the Jewish people today is literally rooted in our cultural mores, our cultural foundations, because all the world looked at the Jewish people as, as being wrong and different. Romans didn't mind the Jews believing something different as long as they could say, well, what's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. Rome could say that to the Jew, but the Jew could not say that. They said, you're wrong. And think for a moment about our culture today, what it's trying to do to Christianity. And some Christians are falling into what the Jewish people fell into time and time again before that Babylonian exile. To say that there are many ways to God. Absolutely not. What made the Jewish people different was that they believed in one God. That there was only one God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we read this. There is one God, one Lord, Father and King of us all. The Jewish people recite the Shema prayer in the morning and at night every day if they are a devout, devout Orthodox Jew because it is the foundation of who they are. Israel, 
its place. So we've talked about its thought, its foundational thought. Now I want you to think for a moment about literally where the promised land was. There are major empires, major people groups, major of, of industry, business, agriculture. You have Rome, you have Egypt, and you have Asia, Persia and Babylon, Egypt and Africa, Rome and Greece and all of Europe, and right in the middle, the crossroads of those three major areas is the promised land. I often as a child would hear about the land flowing with milk and honey and see the pictures of Israel and say, that's not so good. Why would God put his children there? The land of Goshen in Egypt is far better farmland than almost anywhere in Israel. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers out in the, in the lands of Asia, out by Persia and Babylon, are, are much vaster and, and much more fertile than Israel. When you think of, of France and you think of Italy and you think of its agricultural abilities and you think of Israel and you say, land flowing with milk and honey? Well, compared to the deserts around it, it certainly was. But why would God place his people, the vessel by which the Messiah would come, where he did? It was the crossroads of the world. Wow. Our sovereign God, planning from before time even existed, when Abraham did not even really know who God was, had a rudimentary understanding of, of who God was. You think of Rachel and Leah and how they brought with them the, the household gods. You think of Sarah who brought with her the household gods, some of the idols of their past. That's not the God that we serve. Abraham was, as a child, being taught and mentored. And Isaac and Jacob were being taught and mentored into the faith of the, the one true God. God takes Abraham out of Babylon, out of Persia, and brings him to the promised land where God's people will be established, where the children of Israel will, will flourish at the crossroads of the three major empires of the world, which get conquered by Rome and become one empire. And all those three, all the information, all the, the commerce travels through the heart of Israel. What a mighty God we serve. In the fullness of time, the Jewish people bring the thought of who they are, their history, of God's revelation. They bring the place because of the crossroads. They bring that faith in a monotheistic one God alone. The, the prayer, prayer in, in Hebrew that is actually said each morning and at, me, at each night is Shema Ye Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad, which is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, this message that was, was held by the Jewish people as their personal legacy, because they were God's chosen people and the Gentiles were the dogs, even though all through the Old Testament, the prophets said, you are blessed to be a blessing to the nations. From you will come the Messiah that will bring the peace, wholeness to the world. The Jewish people held that message and they were the, the custodians, so to speak, of God's word. So they, they have the, the foundational thought of, of revelation, the foundational thought of monotheism, the, the place, the crossroads. They also have the future hope. 
They were raised with the wonder and truth and grace of the Messiah. They expected, they were on the edge of their seat looking for the Messiah, the, the Savior, the Lamb, the one who would redeem and suffer. Now, they twisted because all human beings, you and I, sinful and fallen as we are, they twisted God's revelation. And they wanted the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus, to establish an earthly kingdom, to reestablish Israel as, as an empire like Solomon, like David. And yet, that was not the Old Testament's prophecy. Yet, that was not God's will. But they had this future hope, this messianic hope. And that was a hope that the known world, the Romans and the Greeks and the Persians, the Egyptians, heard and understood. What else did the Jewish people bring to the table, so to speak, to make the time that Christ would come the right time? They had an ethical moral structure, an ethical moral system that bridged that stoic mindset and that Epicurean mindset, that strict following of the rules for an eternity afterlife. And there is no afterlife. Just live for the day, have pleasure, enjoy. Both of those came together under the ethical moral structure of the Old Testament that said the highest beauty is a relationship with God because of his grace. And so this moral law that the Jewish people brought to the plate, the table, so to speak, was taught. The revelation was taught, Old Testament, throughout all of the Mediterranean world. For approximately 300 years before Christ, there were synagogues throughout the Mediterranean, not just in Israel, in Greece, in Egypt, in Antioch. Around the Mediterranean, these synagogues, these places of learning, these places of fellowship taught the Old Testament. They taught God's statutes and laws. They taught that the Almighty God wanted a relationship with people and that an individual could come to know God and that the Messiah was coming. And people were ready. The Jewish people were ready. Even non-Jewish people, many of them, became proselyte Jews. They found the truth of a monotheistic God to be overwhelmingly understandable, and they accepted him. They looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. And think for a moment about that synagogue structure that the church someday would, would use, churches being planted all over the place, synagogues were planted all over the place. What did Paul do on his missionary journeys? The Men's Breakfast Bible Study Group has been studying the book of Acts. The very first thing Paul would do when he walked into a town, when he walked into a city, when he walked into a community, was go to the synagogue and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. After the Babylonian exile, temple worship had stopped because there was no temple. They were in exile. And the understanding of the synagogue, the understanding of small groups of, of believers emerged. You didn't have to go to the temple to worship, to sacrifice. If you had 10 individuals, 10 men, you could get together and have a fellowship. And this permeated Jewish culture. And they were ready for the messianic hope of Jesus Christ. And the church was ready for the house church, the small church, the fellowship to be established throughout the entire Roman Empire. In the fullness of time, the stage was set by Rome, by Greece, and by the Jewish people.
quick overview. The time was right. People were hungry. Their gods had lost their potency. They had been conquered by Rome. Militarily, their gods could not stand. Intellectually, the language of Greece was throughout the empire. The roads of Rome were free to travel. And the intellectual pursuits of the schools of thought coming out of Athens created a situation where polytheism, believing in many gods, the god of a tree, the god of a mountain, the god of the sun, the god of the earth, was not plausible anymore. And so the time was ripe. The Jewish people had carried and been nurtured by God the revelation, both general revelation and special revelation. General revelation, all mankind could see. God can be seen in the world around us. And so all of humanity was looking and hungering but the Jewish people carried the legacy, the history of special revelation. God Almighty stepping into our existence, stepping into our history, speaking with us, mentoring us, molding us. The pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. God shaping and molding his people to be the vessel by which the Messiah would come. At that moment, the largest landmass to be under one rule was, and it was the only time and is the only time. You know when that'll change? Scripture tells us the time of the Antichrist will be when the world will come under one rule. But Rome created the moment, the perfect moment, for which Jesus was to have his advent his coming into the world. So we have the political and the institutional and the historical world set for Jesus Christ. Tonight's lecture has been on the stage was set in the fullness of time. Jesus said, all things are ready in the in book of uh, Gospel of Mark. And so, our beginning of our lecture series has this foundation that our sovereign God set the stage and at the right moment, Jesus steps into the world. Our next lecture is going to be on the cornerstone, on Jesus himself, the historical Jesus. Who was he? What was, what was his character? What was, what was his personality? Both seeing that in scripture and even seeing that in extra-biblical sources. What was his message? What was his work? And then our third lecture is going to be looking at the emergence of the church, the early church, where we're going to be talking about the first major controversy. And I hope that you will be in kind of expectation, wondering what is the first controversy? What is the first battle in the church? So my friends, let's close in prayer as we are blessed together, as we looked at history, the emergence of how God set the stage for the coming of Christ. Father, we acknowledge that we are fully fallen, sinful human beings, that we cannot grasp you unless you first reach down and touch our hearts, our minds, our very souls. We thank you for, for your holy, written, inspired word. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for its revelation, its special revelation to us. We thank you for your general revelation, how we can see you in, in the world around us. And Lord, we ask that you call us into a deeper walk with you and that we would be used by you to share the good news of Christ with the world around us. You have set the stage 
in our lives with our friends and acquaintances. And we look at history and we marvel at how you set the stage for the coming of Christ. To you be glory and honor and majesty now and forevermore. Amen. Until next time, my friends, may we as Christians help others have faith, but may we also be thinking Christians, not simply feeling Christians, and not Christians who follow laws or rules, but who walk in a relationship with God. Go in peace and walk with God. Amen.